Well, thank you, everyone. Good day. It is, uh, it's a great privilege and honor to be here with, uh, with everybody at Palantir. On behalf of, uh, of the entire Jacobs team, I want to thank Palantir for the invite uh, and the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, before diving in, I, uh, I did want to share with the group a bit of a personal story. Um, this town, Palo Alto, has a, uh, a very unique and special meaning to me. And uh, today, as we were walking from the Sheraton with uh, my colleagues, uh, down University Boulevard, uh, it was a pretty reflective moment for me. And it was reflective from this context. There are three events that happened in this, uh, in this town that uh, have forever changed my own life. Um, the first was I did have uh, the privilege and honor to, uh, to maybe go to school down the street for grad school several years ago. But uh, that definitely did set the course uh, for things that I had the opportunity to do later in life. Uh, secondly, I, I started off my career in the service, and so when I finished grad school, went back to the service, uh, my first job out of, uh, out of the Navy was right here, back in the Bay Area, uh, very close to, uh, to Palo Alto. So that was uh, unique, but that second one really wasn't uh, the piece that was, uh, was life-changing. My younger son was actually born about three kilometers away from here at El Camino Hospital uh, while I was uh, here. And then the third, which actually just happened recently, is I had the, uh, the good fortune to send a, my, my older son to school here uh, in, uh, at, at Stanford. So my quick plug for Go Card, Go Stanford, it's great to be here in Palo Alto and, uh, and love, to, uh, love to share some of those experiences as well. So, so maybe by a show of hands, because I know we have some clients in the, uh, in the room as well as uh, some partners, who here knows who Jacobs is? Okay, that actually was going to be more than, uh, than I suspected. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, you know, Jacobs is one of the world's largest engineering and technical services companies uh, uh, around, US-based. Uh, but before getting into some of the mechanics, I think it's important to set context on where we came from. We started off with deep engineering roots in the chemical process industry and over decades diversified into, into other markets. But what really what Dr. Jacobs started was we're in the business of making our clients' business a better business, hard stop. And that's producing outcomes and providing solutions for some of the world's most difficult uh, issues. So today, the end markets that we're in, critical infrastructure, think water, transportation, environment, energy and, uh, and environment, everything going on around energy transition, advanced facilities, deep domain expertise in life sciences manufacturing, as well as semiconductor manufacturing, and then national security. Uh, we've been in the middle of some of uh, the, the biggest missions uh, around the world, supporting the US, UK, and Australian government. I won't bore you with all the statistics, but needless to say, we're a big company, uh, and we do a lot. We do a lot in the world. But what's probably more interesting, and I love the uh, Simon Sinek uh, uh, reference on start with the why. You know, why do we exist as a company? Who are we? Uh, and, and really is, we are in the middle of some of the most, big, or the biggest megatrends that are affecting us in the world. And, and I list the one there, climate response. I heard a statistic the other day, is that uh, this is kind of dark. So um, uh, bear with me on the darkness, and then we'll bring it to light. Um, if you think about the probability of some kind of nuclear holocaust, it, it is, there is a probability there. I'm not even going to mention it. However, if you compare that to the probability, if we do nothing as a society on solving climate change, or at least slowing climate change with everything we're doing around climate response, you know, that's a 100% probability that we won't exist. That's my dark comment. Let's get back to light. Uh, so what we're doing is, is we're in the middle from that science-based domain expertise that we built over decades of addressing each one of these issues. And kind of when you go around the matrix and you see it coming down to I mean, wh what are all of these issues surrounded by in the physical world? Data. All about data. So our partnership with Palantir has really accelerated that effort on taking deep domain science-based experience coupling that with strong data science and data platforms to really reinvent the way we're solving these, uh, these issues for, for our clients. And so some common themes there, I think some of the, uh, my, my, my uh, predecessor speakers uh, spoke to them. Speed, that goes without saying. 
you know, we at Jacobs, we can, we can customize for a single, single client in a single market in a single geography, but being able to do that at scale across multiple sites around the world, that's what pa the Palantir partnership brings to us. And then specialization, you know, we have deep domain expertise in the science, and with Palantir, deep domain expertise in the data science, whether it be any of the platforms we're talking about today, that combination is powerful, and it leads to this. Our vision for the world is to take that deep domain science expertise, couple that with data science and data platforms, and make a positive impact in the world. We do have a use case. My colleague, Shannon Miller, is, gonna, is not going to join me on the stage. I'm going to leave the stage and give the stage to her. But uh, look forward to uh, interfacing and interacting with everyone moving forward. So thanks, everyone. All right, thank you, Bob. Good day, everybody. Um, so as Bob mentioned, I run our digital data, cyber, and cloud solutions business at Jacobs, where we're really focused on solving some of the most complex problems in critical infrastructure. And I've been really um, honored and excited to develop this partnership along with our team with Palantir to really solve the most complex problems for critical infrastructure and the solutions that are around that. As Bob mentioned, our goal at Jacobs is to create a safer, more resilient, and connected world. And I can't think of a use case that isn't more exciting than focusing on, on how we um, improve the water cycle for the entire planet. So if you think about this, this is critical for a lot of reasons. Not only climate change is stretching our need to expand our ability to, to leverage our resources, the need to reduce our carbon footprint, as Bob said, not soon, but quickly, very fast. And then, of course, the staffing shortages and the waves of retirements of some of our most experienced and excellent operators across the entire utility community. So although this might not be the most glamorous use case, our friend Bernardo at JD Power got me really excited about buying a new car. I probably don't need to buy a new car. Um, I'm going to get you excited about how we're harnessing the power of artificial intelligence to improve water treatment. So we're going to see how AI acts as a co-pilot. Sean did a great job showing how we set this up, from not only using it in real time to optimize um, decision making while we're operating our utilities, but also when we think about when the stakes get higher in the wake of a, a massive storm, and then of course for long-term planning and how we deploy our assets going forward. So this allows our operators to interface with troves of data, complex data using natural language as we've seen today. Um, so I'm really excited to show three use cases of what we're working on together with Palantir and what we've got um, getting deployed here to our customers very soon. All right, so first up we're gonna talk about how we're operationalizing our data. This is Jacobs' Aqua DNA platform where we combine our deep domain expertise and wastewater treatment coupled with Palantir and the Foundry platform and AIP. So first up, if you take a look at this, we're looking at the entire city. So this is an entire wastewater treatment system on our Aqua DNA platform powered by AIP. So if you think about it, it encompasses millions of people. It's the city's core infrastructure, it's the drainage, the sewage, the treatment plants, and everything that happens in this complex system. So it's the valves, the sensors, and the catchment basins. And at any moment in time, our operators are making thousands of decisions to optimize what they're doing. So if you think about it, first of all, if you send too much water to a wastewater treatment plant, you could flood it, causing millions of dollars in equipment damage. Um, that's taking, that would take down the, abilities, uh, the city's ability to treat wastewater. And if you don't manage your storage appropriately ahead of a storm, you could run out of critical capacity, causing an overflow and leaking polluted water to the local environment. So to guide these decisions, systems are typically outfitted with numerous sensors. And what we've heard from our utility operators is in the last two years, they've captured more data than in the last 20 years combined. Think about how difficult that is. The flow of information, no pun intended, um, becomes very difficult for them to leverage and optimize their, their systems. And on top of this, with all these assets being added to the networks, it introduces a new, a new vulnerability for cyber attacks. All right, 
So in the face of all these challenges, let's see how Aqua DNA helps me monitor our day-to-day -day operations with the data that we already have. So this is just day-to-day -day operations in a utility treatment um, network. So first of all, everything is centralized in Foundry. We've been able to connect all of our data from design, operations, security, and bring it all together within, within the ontology. So this means we can compound our returns and introduce um, and, and have fewer vulnerabilities. So we're able to rapidly ingest and process all the disparate sets of data, which were previously disconnected, creating confusion, confusion and often um, unproductive noise in the system. So again, it's all being processed real time into standardized, reusable models or our ontology. So AIP is, is enabling me to proactively monitor for the changing conditions in the system that might require human attention, such as maybe a cyber breach or even a clog. Uh, we were talking last night, uh, surprisingly, one of the things that we find often in clogged wastewater treatment systems are blue jeans. We were hoping to maybe uh, recycle some jeans for you all here today, but, but we didn't do that. Um, so anyway, so we'll see here that there's an alert, that there's a potential clog. Let's assume it's some, some Levi's jeans in one of our drains. <clears throat> so I'm going to zoom in on this clog and see what action I need to take. So again, we've got real-time digestible data of what's happening and where this clog fits into our system. It is gonna require maintenance, so I obviously wanna understand how urgently I need to dispatch a crew. And I also know that a storm is forecasted for this weekend, and I wanna make sure that I'm taking that into account and in how I make prioritized decisions. So with that in mind, I use the AIP assistant to help pull in that forecast for the upcoming storm, and it simulates it across the entire system. So AIP is going to pull in the weather forecast data. It's going to bring it in as a new layer and estimate how much wastewater is going to flow into the system. The AI is then able to call on our specialized Jacobs Design simulation models, such as our flood modeler platform, to really understand the impacts of this storm. So I can see now that we're getting two new alerts with this simulation, with one showing that this clog is going to result in an overflow. So clearly this warrants a high priority fix. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and assign maintenance in the platform and then that automatically updates their schedule and it redirects the crew. This conversational real-time scenario model is really, it's a huge step forward from the complex manual work that would have been required to perform this analysis in the past and get that maintenance crew to address the clog before the storm comes. And this is really due to our ability to query massive amounts of data in real time and map out different scenarios so we can make the critical decisions in a timely, in a timely manner. So next, we're gonna amp up the stakes. So we've got a, a storm coming and we're gonna see how we can leverage our Aqua DNA platform to, to manage um, the, the forecasted storm. So here, I'm looking again across the entire system, but now I'm seeing how this storm is gonna impact us in the future. So the platform tracks where wastewater is entering the system and continually updates our forward projections, feeding our risk models and giving us alerts. Only now, in addition to those alerts, we have a few types of adjustments that are gonna take place automatically without me needing to dispatch any crew. These are being executed by our AI agents that we've been talking about today in some of our other stories. Um, they're trained in our system's historical data, and they help adaptively keep things in check throughout the entire storm. They're combining machine learning with our expertise and our flood modeler platform to really define optimal system performance. It's important to know, I'm still in full control. I can monitor all the actions that the agents are taking, their effects, and adjust, override, or disable their behaviors. But they're taking care of hundreds of, of optimal decision-making uh, adjustments for me, which could include things like adjusting valves, um, diverting wastewater, and updating some of the, the uh, treatment parameters. So with that being said, some actions are clearly too consequential to be taken automatically, right? So here we can see that AIP has surfaced an alert. It's showing me that there's a risk of an overflow in the next two hours, and it's gonna make some recommended diversions to avoid that overflow. However, it is showing that it requires my input to take action. So I'm gonna dig into those recommendations to understand what's driving it and the potential trade-offs associated with it. 
So it helps me see the path leading to the overflow risk, as well as its recommended diversion of the wastewater from a northern to a southern catchment basin. I can see the projections and the predicted metrics, helping me understand the full picture of what's likely to happen if I make the diversion or if I don't. And so there's a trade-off here, as you can see. On one hand, there's a 24% risk of overflow if I take no action. And on the other hand, the proposed diversion routes wastewater to a less effective or efficient wastewater treatment plant, um, increasing the total treatment cost that's above a threshold parameter that I have in the system. So this is why the AI is unable to facilitate this action automatically. It needs my input and my approval to progress. I might also want to dig into what's behind these calculations so I can take a look at what assumptions, data models, calculations, and simulations were behind making that recommendation. I can do that right here as well. So based on this information, I do decide that the best path is to go ahead and, and in fact approve this diversion. I, I uh, approve the diversion in the system, downstream actions flow automatically, and, and approval processes and communications kick off as well. I can monitor them and see how it plays out to ensure it plays out as I expected. So in a situation like this, the automatic capture of all of our decisions and reasoning is essential. We need the platform to keep a full history of all of our actions, whether it was done by a human or by the AI, along with the associated context and the state of the world. And we can do that all within AIP. This enables me to show regulators why I took decisions, what the circumstances, and what alternatives were presented when I made those decisions. I can also use this to inform future operations, um, if future operations planning, as well as train the AI for future events. The great thing is all of this is controllable. AIP allows me to be in the loop of all of our AI automations, the data they're using, the patterns of reasoning that they're relying on, the guardrails um, that are set around it, and it makes sure that it's um, performing accurately. It also enforces these guardrails. So the level of actions, the criticality is where a human needs to be in a loop is decided ahead of time. And then we can also dig in further to those actions, how it was all um, generated, and of course, report, uh, create a report at any time. All right, so in the last scenario, we're gonna look at how we leverage AI, AIP for future planning um, long term. So in the aftermath of the storm, um, it sort of, you know, it's ticked off a few things for me. I want to think about long-term planning of my wastewater treatment facility. So I want to re-examine my long-term plans. I want to not only use historical information, but also forward-looking data, right? So to really create a complex scenario for my simulation. So let's go ahead and we're going to build a case study that looks 30 years into the future. All right. <clears throat> so we're first going to start with our current world and layer in things like population growth, urban development, and of course climate change. We're first going to ask the AIP assistant to pull in plans for development and the forecasted population growth. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the top 10% of storms last year and then add 25% to that, which is what's been recommended by the AI. And that's going to build our case study for future planning. So now I want to test how our current infrastructure would fare in this scenario. So as the simulation runs, it shows me that there's several overflow risks. I want to look into the infrastructure level changes to prevent this from happening well into the future. So in the past, being an engineer, I know I used to do this. I'd you know, sit down and, and work on simulations and think about um, different analyses and simulations that I would do to prevent this, and it would have taken maybe months or years to really think about um, what the potential impacts are. So now with AIP, we can use this um, you know, immediately in real time to help us understand what exactly can be done. So what it shows me is adding uh, wastewater treatment plants or storage tanks would, of course, solve this problem, but at a huge monetary and environmental cost. So we're going to see if we can improve our network's uh, resilience by improving our ability to divert wastewater within the system. 
So for example, I asked the AIP assistant if any wastewater treatment plants or tanks have spare capacity in the system, and it identifies three for me. I then ask for it to make recommendations or adjustments to the system to improve or rebalance capacity. So it takes into account all the other factors that I've outlined, population growth, urban development, and it recommends that I consider installing two new pipes. So I can adjust this further, but for now I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, generate a report that captures this case study, gives me my recommendations for my stakeholders, shows me all of the data and simulations that went into the analysis. And again, if you think about it, this would have taken us a long time to pull this all together with probably a lot of different opinions around what it looked like and tweaking any of those assumptions would have you know, uh, created a lot of recycle and churn. So we're really excited about where we're going. You can see we're developing an end-to-end -end solution that brings everything together, whether that's security for mission-critical infrastructure, it provides control that keeps humans in the loop at every step of the way where you prescribe it, and it's real time. It provides us actionable AIP assistance to deliver those in-the-moment decisions for simulations, long-term planning, and it helps us make sense out of the massive volumes of data that we're creating all of the time. And it gives our operators this natural language interface to interact with to really make these complex decisions when they need to be making them. And of course, it always has the ability to show us the context, the inputs, why decisions were made. I'm excited, if you can't tell, about our uh, relationship with Palantir, mostly because it's gonna allow us to solve problems at a pace and a scale, and it's really that pace, right, that's gonna have a tremendous impact um, on the world around us for all of our people, our customers, our stakeholders. And although we talked about just wastewater treatment today, I hope you see the applicability to a lot of different markets or industries and sectors around how we can leverage uh, the power of AIP, deep domain expertise, as Bob talked about, to really um, improve our world around us. So thank you very much. <laughs>